of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. A very warm welcome to St. Mary's the University Church today, particularly if you're joining us for the first time. And also a word of welcome for those who are joining us from home today. This is the Sunday after Ascension Day, and the period between Ascension Day and the Feast of Pentecost, nine days, a period by tradition when we pray for the life of the Church, for the gift of the Holy Spirit to animate our life and witness, our mission and ministry. And this year, this period of prayer for the life of the Church coincides also with Christian Aid Week. So today, I invite you to reflect on the life and the mission of God's Church. And it's very good to welcome as our preacher today, Al Dutton, a member of our congregation who used to work for Christian Aid and now works as the director of SCIAF. So as we prepare to worship God in word and sacrament, we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ calls us to share the heavenly banquet of his love. Let us acknowledge our unworthiness and receive God's grace, that we may be made ready to enter his joy. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by the Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen.
God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ is gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together the crowd numbered about 120 people and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us throughout the time that, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph, called Bar Sabbath, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. For the word of the Lord. first and the last, says the Lord, and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Alleluia. 
Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus looked up to heaven and prayed, Father, I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit down. In the first reading, we heard one of several passages at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, which describe the organisation of the early Christian community. Here, Judas is replaced, and the Apostles, who were charged with going into the world to preach the Gospel, were restored to twelve. In the early days after Pentecost, there are repeated references, firstly, to preaching and miracles of the apostles, secondly, to the breaking of bread and prayer, and thirdly, to the way they look after one another, particularly those in need. In chapter 2, we hear that the faithful all lived together and owned everything in common. They sold their goods and possessions and shared out the proceeds among themselves, according to what each one needed. Again in chapter 4 we're told, none of the members was ever in want, as all those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money from them to present it to the apostles. And it was then distributed to any members who might be in need. In chapter 6, however, we're told that the number of disciples was increasing and the apostles were overwhelmed by the care of the needy in the community. 
Amidst complaints that the Hellenist widows were being overlooked, the Twelve called a full meeting of the disciples, arguing that they shouldn't neglect the word of God to give out food. They instructed the disciples to choose seven men of good reputation, filled with the spirit and wisdom, to take on this duty. And so the first deacons were appointed, charged with care of the poor and needy in the community, and charitable activity was instituted within the structure of the early church. To this day, the mission of the church comprises three inseparable elements, preaching the good news, prayer and celebration of the sacraments, and care for the needy in our midst. Today marks the end of Christian Aid Week, and just as the first deacons were instituted to feed the widows, so Christian Aid is the official agency of 40 Protestant denominations in the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. They are our agents, our eyes and ears and hands, as we seek to care for the poorest and most needy in the world. Similarly, here in our own parish, the Parish Council has established our Faith in Action Committee to help us contribute to transforming our society to reflect the Kingdom of God through loving acts of neighbourliness and service to all, and by challenging the structures and systems that create and maintain poverty and injustice. When looking for the origin or foundation of these commitments, it's interesting to note that Jesus' public life is framed between two episodes that put the poorest and neediest at the forefront of his personal mission suggesting that the whole gospel should be read through this lens. The first, which is almost his manifesto for everything that was to follow, occurred when he went into the synagogue and took up the scroll of Isaiah. Having just spent 40 days in the wilderness preparing for his public ministry, he proclaimed, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because I came to bring good news to the poor, liberty to captives, sight for the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And if we fast forward to the end of his public life, just as he sets his face towards Jerusalem and the passion, death and resurrection that will follow, he stops to spell out what is expected of us at the last judgment. For what shall we be judged? And here the answer is very simple and practical. Talking of separating the sheep from the goats, he says, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And when the righteous asked when they did all of this, his answer is equally simple. I tell you solemnly, insofar as you did this to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. Nothing brings these concepts alive in the abstract like the narrative force of storytelling. Alive to this, when asked who is my neighbour, Jesus replied with the tale of the Good Samaritan. This is an incredibly rich story and there isn't time to begin to do justice to it here. However, it hinges on a mutual encounter of neighbourliness and love. The man left half dead is the neighbour of all those who pass along the road. And his suffering is the occasion of an overwhelming sense of connection in the Samaritan. In Greek, sorry, in translation we are told, he is moved with compassion. But the word in the original Greek literally means he was moved in his gut. He was seized in his gut. His reaction is visceral, manifesting an essential truth in human nature that we are bound together in one human family that we are all neighbours, and that when truly confronted by this in its rawest form, we can only respond in love. Not to do so would be inhumane. The danger is 
that our hearts become hard, we rehearse our excuses, and we become impervious to the cries of the poor. This Christian Aid Week, are we willing to hear the cries of the poorest and most marginalised in the world, those who are forgotten or suffer injustice, and be moved? Or have our hearts become hard? Will we open our hearts and make room for the encounter that will move us? The saying, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, feed him for a lifetime, is often quoted with the suggestion that the latter is better than the former. Sustainability and the dignity that people derive from being able to produce and provide for their families and loved ones are clearly very important and are the goals of development. But sometimes, particularly in times of crisis, people just need to be fed, clothed or housed. The church has long recognised how essential these basic needs are, and the seven traditional works of mercy closely follow those actions that I listed from Matthew's account of the Last, Supper, of the last Judgment. And there is a third level of engagement, which goes beyond the immediate needs, beyond helping people to provide for themselves. And this is to tackle the deep underlying root causes of poverty and injustice and to build just systems and structures. I hope many of you like me received a card like this through your door this week. If you didn't, don't worry, it's all available online. But in Christian Aid this year, they're concentrating on a number of women in Kenya whose stories clearly show how hard their lives already are and how much more difficult they're becoming as their weather patterns change. One of them featured on the, the card is Rose. Rose is caught in a cycle of climate chaos, from severe drought to flooding. Extreme weather robs her of what she needs to survive, a reliable source of water. Without water, every day is a struggle. Without water, Rose is thirsty and hungry. This is her climate crisis. When I was a young girl, there was plenty of food, Rose says. Now the rains are unreliable. The climate crisis has made the weather more erratic and extreme, and Rose's community are feeling the brunt of it. For months at a time, Rose lives with drought. I often feel hungry, Rose says. Because of climate change, I worry a lot about food. I pray to God that the rainfall will become normal like it used to be. In recent years, the drought has been so bad that it's caused a hunger crisis. Crops wither and die, rivers run dry, and people struggle to survive. Rose strives to provide for her grandchildren who live with her. She does all she can to give them happy childhoods. But the climate crisis is driving her to the brink. In times of drought, Rose sets out on a long and dangerous journey every morning to collect water for her family. She walks on an empty stomach. We have to walk long distances. We are suffering, Rose said. While she walks, her stomach gives her stabbing pains. She feels weary under the hot sun. But if she gives up, her children will suffer hunger and thirst. With a dam full of water, Rose would be free from her long, painful journeys. She'd have time to grow fresh vegetables for her family to eat. And she could see her grandchildren grow up and live life in all its fullness. So what can we do for Rose and for thousands like her? Firstly, we can pray for them. Often when I'm travelling and visiting projects, people will say to me, when you go home, please thank the people for their prayers. We know we are not forgotten. And often, particularly when people are desperate, knowing they're not forgotten can be the most important thing of all. Secondly, we can support Christian Aid Week financially, and I urge you all to give as generously as you can. And finally, we can work with Christian Aid and others to urge world leaders to tackle climate change with urgency and ambition when they come to Glasgow for the UN conference in November. 
And details of all of these activities, as I said earlier, can be found on Christian Aid's website. Finally, as I close, I have sat in the homes and compounds of many women like Rose, and they have offered me the most incredible hospitality. They have quenched my thirst. They have slaughtered goats and chickens to feed me. They've taken me into their homes to sleep, and they've even on occasions given up their beds for me. Their voices are the most precious and important, but they are hard to hear. As we think about how we can build a culture of encounter and serve the last, the least, and the lost as a parish, I leave you with these words of William Butler Yeats, who powerfully expresses who powerfully expresses the fragility of those who hold the key to unlock our generosity. More commonly read as romantic love poetry, they are for me a heartfelt appeal from those we serve who often struggle to be seen or be heard. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths inwrought with golden and silver light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and of the half-light, I would spread the cloths under your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread my dreams beneath your feet. Tread softly, for you tread on my dreams. Amen. We stand to profess the faith in which we seek to grow. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, on the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life of the world to come. Amen. Let us join our prayers with those of our Saviour Christ, seeking the Father's blessing and the gifts of the Spirit. Dear Lord, as spring slowly surrenders to summer, we thank you for the wonders of renewal in our countryside. We marvel at lambs and rabbits frolicking on new grass, birds nesting and dew festooned cobwebs glistening in the morning sun. Dear Lord, we thank you for the sun, wind, rain, for minerals in the soil, plants that grow, and all birds and beasts of farm and field. Now the green blade riseth from the ground and grain, wheat that in dark earth many days has lain. Love lives again that with the dead has been. Loving Father, in the same way that you sent spring and summer to replenish 
the natural world, please send us a message of renewal to uplift us in our faith so we can serve you better. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving God, we bring before you the wants of those who suffer in our troubled world. Look with mercy upon those who today are fleeing from danger or who are wrongly imprisoned, the homeless and the hungry. Bless those who work to bring them relief. Inspire generosity and compassion in all our hearts. Dear Lord, please help religious leaders of all faiths so they may set good examples and impart goodwill and tolerance to their followers. Indeed, please give wisdom to all in authority. Inspire them to put the needs of the vulnerable first. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for our university, which started in our St Mary's all those years ago to serve your purpose. We pray for students to help them make the most of their wonderful opportunities. Let them work hard, but let them have time to rest and enjoy themselves. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for the poor in health, especially those close to our hearts, including Valerie, Ursula, Caroline, Jenny, Susie, Tris, Maud, Nick and Penelope. And may the following departed rest in eternal peace, Raymond Christian and Galena Brogdon. Dear Lord, please comfort people with degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and give courage and patience to their carers. Give us a better understanding of the daily struggles faced by those with mental health problems. Let us pray for the sick in countries that don't have the standards of health care that we take for granted. We pray for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of all power and might, who art the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of thy name, increase in us true religion, nourish us all with goodness, and of thy great mercy, keep us in the same. Merciful Father. I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ descended to death and hell and passed through doors locked by fear to breathe the spirit of peace and make us one humanity. Nothing can now separate us from the love of God. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet each other in the peace of Christ.
Blessed be God, by whose grace creation is renewed, by whose love heaven is opened, by whose mercy we offer our sacrifice of praise. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is our great High Priest, who has entered once for all into the heavenly sanctuary, evermore to pour upon your Church the grace and comfort of your Holy Spirit. He is the one who has gone before us, who calls us to be united in prayer, as were his disciples in the upper room, while they awaited his promised gift, the life-giving Spirit of Pentecost. Therefore, all creation yearns with eager longing as angels and archangels sing the endless hymn of praise. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine, 
Again he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with Mary, the Mother of God, and all the saints, to feast at your table in heaven, through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The body of Christ. Amen. The blood of Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, giver of love and power, your Son, Jesus Christ, has sent us into all the world to preach the gospel of his kingdom. Confirm us in this mission and help us to live the good news we proclaim through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We say together, God of truth, we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands the bread of life. Strengthen our faith that we may grow in love for you and for each other. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. seated. Friends, it's very good to welcome you to St. Mary's this morning and good to welcome those joining us from home. You'll see that this morning we've made a few adjustments to the seating plan. Um, please do get in touch with me to offer feedback if the adjustments have proved problematic in any way. We're working with one metre plus in the nave rather than the two metre social distancing which we have had for some months now. Obviously, it's still essential to wear masks, and we want to ensure that everyone feels safe. Next Sunday, the Bishop will be coming for the confirmation service, and we hope that it will be possible to offer some refreshments outside, um, but that will depend on the weather. The Bampton Lectures will take place on Tuesday the 18th of May, and this year the Reverend Canon Dr Jessica Martin is talking about the four-dimensional Eucharist. The session on the 18th of May will be a hybrid event. That means you can attend in person or watch it online. Please sign up if you'd like to receive the link for the lecture this week. On Thursday lunchtime at 12.45, there'll be the weekly Bible study on Zoom where we're studying the book of Genesis. You can find details about that at the back of the order of service. Now, my thanks to all those who helped with the gardening day at Hollywell Cemetery yesterday. We're starting to make a real difference and gravestones which have been completely concealed under decades of ivy are beginning to emerge again. We hope to have a gardening day each month over the summer and details about the day in June will be published shortly. On Thursday we will be interviewing candidates for the role of assistant priest at St Mary's. There are three candidates and please do pray for them and for the interview panel as we discern who may serve here 
as one of our clergy in future. You'll see in the order of service that there is a note about an opera taking place here at St Mary's on Saturday. It's the first concert to take place here in some time, although I think it may already be sold out. But do check the website in case there are any returns and it would be lovely to see you there. Finally, there will be a retiring collection for Christian A today and please do give generously and our thanks to Al for his sermon today. Will you please stand for the blessing? Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Spirit of truth lead you into all truth, give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.